This video is brought to you by Fumafax and its upcoming release, but more on that later. In October 1999, Amriville, California, at Pixar Studios, there was a guy named Andrew Witkin, leaning back on his chair with eyes fixed on the monitor, tackling a serious problem. At the time, Pixar was working on the Monster Inc. movie, and Andrew was tasked with finding a solution for this problem. You see, Boo, a young animated girl with an oversized t-shirt. And they wanted to make her walk and run across the screen without her clothing sticking strangely to her body and they were trying to find a solution for how cloth interacts with itself in addition to wrinkling and shifting in response to her movements. But the technology they had couldn't handle this level of realism, cause at that point no one had done it before. The issue was deceptively simple, but technically daunting as well. You see, Pixar software, while powerful at the time, wasn't advanced enough to make Boo's shirt flow and respond to movement the way real cloth would. So Witkin, as a computer scientist and a pioneer in physics-based animation, was the go-to expert for this kind of challenge. He had already made waves in computer graphics with groundbreaking work in dynamics and particle systems, but he knew that Pixar was asking for something unprecedented in animation. So how did Witkin solve this problem, who helped him find the answers, and what are some unexpected things that happened to him unfortunately later in his life, while he was at the top of his game? Before we continue, I want to tell you guys that Fumafax, one of the most widely used gaseous fluid effect generators in the industry, has released a new update, which is Fumafax 6.5 for 3ds Max. And just so you know, Fumafax has powered visual effects in blockbuster films such as Spider-Man, Iron Man, and Ghost Rider and has been utilized by leading studios worldwide. The NodeWorks introduced in version 6.0 added multi-physics simulation capabilities to Fumafax, including particle simulation, rope, rigid and soft body dynamics, inflatable soft bodies, and node-based access to Fumafax simulations and sources, among many other features. And Fumafax 6.5 updates expand node works with physics-based and GPU-accelerated PBD liquid simulation, tailored for artists working with small-scale liquid effects. Among other features, PBD liquids give you as an artist control over key parameters such as viscosity, surface tension, and vorticity, enabling quick and flexible simulations for liquids, bubbles, and foam. Additionally, these PPD liquids are fully integrated with NodeWorks memory caching, allowing for instant playback directly inside the viewport. iSurface has also been updated and now provides fast and reliable liquid meshing with advanced filtering options using velocity-based masks. The update also improved rendering workflows, where Arnold Render Engine provides foam rendering out of the box through Arnold points or volumes, further streamlining the visual effects process for artists. And now back to the video. Born in July 1952, Andrew Witkin was an influential computer scientist and researcher, known for his contribution to computer graphics especially through his pioneering work in physics-based modeling and animation. However, many would argue that his best work was on physically-based simulations, such as his groundbreaking efforts on hair dynamics with Taz Hair Simulation System, as well as another simulation system that was destined to become the golden standard in modern cloth simulation, but more on that later. Monster Inc., The Incredibles, and Ratatouille, if I were to ask you what they have in common, you would probably say that they are amazing animated films that make you feel nostalgic, but also, they do feature some incredible cloth simulations for their era. As a viewer, you might not think about it as much, but those pieces of fabric called clothes are an important part of storytelling. Take Bob for example. His clothes are tight, and he's got a really big belly. But when he transforms into Mr. Incredible, he gets slimmer and wears a slick suit. 
to communicate to us a superhero transformation. And for that, you need exceptional clothes animation, however animated clothes in CGI wasn't as easy as it is today. It is actually tricky to pinpoint the exact time, but their CG clothes revolution started around the time they were developing Monsters Inc. Andrew himself joined Pixar Animation Studios back in 1998 as a senior animation scientist, and he made his debut as an effects artist and an animation software development engineer on Toy Story 2. In Monster Inc., the misleading simple task of animating cloth posed a huge challenge due to the hundreds of creases and wrinkles that can occur in clothing when wearers move. For example, with Boo, the animators first animated her shirtless, then they used their in-house software fist to apply the shirt over her body, so that every time she moved, her clothes also reacted to her movements more naturally. That was good as a start. But they still had to tackle the problem of cloth-to-cloth -cloth collisions, which are the interactions between two or more cloth objects in a 3D simulation. For that, Michael Cass, Pixar's senior scientist, was joined by David Baraf, and of course Andrew Witkin. Together, they developed an algorithm they called Global Intersection Analysis to handle the problem. In a paper the trio published called Entangling Cloth, they explained how the core dynamics of their cloth simulation system mostly follow the work of Baroff and Witkin, both from 1998. This alone already cemented Witkin as a central point in cloth simulation for CGI. But with this new research being used on a big scale movie, it's safe to say that he became one of the key figures in pushing this field forward. And it goes as follows. First, each piece of cloth is represented as a triangle-based mesh of particles, with stretch and shear forces being calculated for each triangle in the mesh, as well as bent forces for each pair of edge-adjacent triangles, which are two triangles in a 3D mesh that share a common edge. Companion damping forces and external forces can be added as well. Next, they implemented a projection method developed by Baraf and Witkin in their 1998 paper, which helped them add some constraints to their solver to move the system forward. Then, when a point on a cloth gets pinched between multiple surfaces, they used a method called flypapering to deal with it. But what does that mean, and what does it do? The collision flypapering method completely detects the flypapered particle's position and velocity. So basically, these are calculated to produce realistic appearance behavior, while still following the cloth to return to its original state smoothly. And this aligns with how clothes behave in the real world. But here's the thing. When you hear it like that, it probably doesn't sound all that fancy. Some might think this is just gibberish, while others would point out that this is how many cloth simulation systems work today. Sure, this is how things work right now, but there was a time where things were so different. You see, dealing with how the fabric interacts with itself and other objects in the environment was a real headache. The collision behavior had to be almost perfect, and to achieve this, early adopters of cloth simulation technology had to spend a lot of time tweaking things before running the simulations, as well as using a variety of post-simulation techniques to fix any part of the mess. It was boring, painful, expensive, and nobody liked to work with it. Over time, experts introduced new approaches to improve cloth simulations intersecting with other objects, and some of them actually did pretty well but figuring out how to stop cloth from colliding with itself was a real problem. Witkin and the team noticed that most of the methods they looked at relied on history mechanic to check if a particle was on the wrong side or not, such as the Volner approach that took great care to guarantee that each motion is intersection-free, provided that the previous one was also intersection-free. But well, the issue is that any error anywhere along the simulation will make the clothes overlap or twist in a way that creates undesirable or unrealistic effects. 
And that's where the global geometric analysis algorithm of our trio comes into play. Now, the content itself is very long, and I definitely recommend checking out the research paper because there is a ton of valuable info in there. But long story short, it is a technique that analyzes intersections globally but instantaneously, rather than locally with history, and essentially, it analyzes the entire cloth mesh or the overall configuration of all intersecting meshes all at once as opposed to focusing on just small, local areas or specific points over time. The algorithm performs a global intersection analysis of the intersecting cloth meshes and describes the current intersection state in order to guide the cloth back to an entangled state when intersections occur and avoid any weird or bad results. Unfortunately, Andrew Witkin passed away in 2010 while scuba diving off the coast of Monterey, California, leaving behind him a remarkable career as a professional and an approach in simulation and cloth animation that is still used to this day as the basis of many cloth simulation software. By making no use of history, representing clothes as a mesh of particles or vertices, and using global geometric analysis of intersections as well as the collision system, which is used till this day as a reference in the field with an influence that can be seen in many mainstream software such as Blender, Houdini, Marvelous Designer and others. And there you have it. I hope you guys found this video useful and informative. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Also, please subscribe to this channel to receive more videos like this. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.